Hey folks, welcome back. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch and your break. Um, before we move forward with our next presentation, we're gonna do our drawing. Had a little excitement for the afternoon. It's supposed to be a blind drawing we took. Gotta close your eyes. <laughs> Deborah Yamashita. <laughs> you are a winner. So Dr. Sarah Kenyon comes to us from the University of Hawaii Family Medicine Residency Program. Previously, she worked in internal and emergency medicine in Australia. She has recently relocated and is opening a primary care practice in Kailua. And in her own words, is a wife mother and friend to many. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sarah Kennedy. Aloha. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, the honor is truly all mine. Um, before I tell you a, a little bit more about me and why I'm here, I would like to find out a little bit about who are you? So I'd like to get a sense of who do we have here in the room. So if I could see by a show of hands, how many people are currently working with patients with eating disorders? Okay, and how many people in the room are dietitians working with people with eating disorders? And how many are therapists? And do we have any physicians in the room already? And other, per do we have students in the room? Can you call out for me some of the, what, what you're studying? out of interest it's not a profession or maybe I mean that's not pro related to your profession okay beautiful and do we have any school teachers or coaches okay so I guess in getting to know a little bit about you it kind of helps me to know how I'm directing what I'm about to say today and I hope I apologize if it's too simplified for the scientists among us, and I apologize if some things get a little bit too complicated for everyone else. Um, I have another question for you. How many people have had in their education more than two hours of formal training in eating disorders? Wow. <laughs> That's sort of similar to the answer to that question I get just about everywhere I go, um, which kind of leads me to why I'm here. I, um, as a primary care physician, and in my journey to become a primary care physician, 
And as my journey as a woman who has children ages 18 to 24, and um, someone who's been connected to universities for over 25 years, I can say that the medical community does not serve this population very well. And I'd like to see that change. And many times when we want to see a change, we have to be the change we want to see. So that's really why I'm here. Um, I know I've talked to people who are dietitians say the same thing, maybe one hour, maybe none at all. I had probably five hours, so I realized that I was lucky. We had a whole ap one afternoon talking about eating disorders. <laughs> but yet, as I over the years, as I had friends, went to medical school with a girl who clearly had, a woman who clearly had anorexia, um, I watched many other doctors in the course of their early training start to um, lose weight very rapidly and probably become dangerously thin. I have had friends who purged and I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. I thought it was physical. I thought I should get it because I'm a doctor and when they came to me and asked for help, well, why, why can't you just eat? Why, why can't you just stop purging? Why would you, why would you want to do that? I didn't get it. And, and I was frustrated, I was super frustrated that my profession really didn't give me any tools to deal with this population whatsoever. And so that's why I'm here. So a, a little bit, I think the background's pretty clear. I trained in Australia, I lived there for 19 years. I'm not Australian, I don't sound Australian. <laughs> well, I am Australian, but I, I don't sound it. I worked in internal medicine and and emergency medicine before coming here and I've just completed the primary care residency program here in Hawaii and will be staying here. And I'm very much a newbie amongst the eating disorder community here and because I've raised my hand very recently and said, I want help, I want to, I want to do this. So I have as much, I have more probably to learn from the people in this room and I'm humbled by the collective experience in this room. So to get started, um, I keep push, pushing the wrong button. Okay, so the goal for my talk with you today is that we, we all wanna improve the care of patients with eating disorders. I wanna talk to you about the role of the primary care physician in the eating disorder team. And I hope to give you some idea of some of the medical complications that are associated with eating disorders. So like, Everyone else, I think I'm going to assume a certain amount of knowledge about criteria and all that sort of thing. But just as a reminder, amongst the, the realm of eating disorders, we have anorexia, bulimia, but also binge eating disorder, and less commonly, but still prevalent, orthorexia, nervosa, purging, diabulimia, night eating disorder, and rumination, and pica. So, I live in a world of numbers, that's my profession. And, but for a moment, let's look at some of these numbers and really think about the people behind these numbers. About half of the 340 something million Americans are on a diet. 20 to 25% will progress to partial or full eating disorders. At least 30 million Americans suffer from an eating disorder in their lifetime, and it is the third most chronic, common chronic illness in adolescent females. They don't discriminate, male, female, young, and old. About 0.9% of American women will suffer from an eating disorder in their lifetime and 1.5% of American women will suffer from bulimia and nervosa in their lifetime. And 2.8% suffer from binge eating disorder in their lifetime. It's hard to put a sense to those numbers, but 2.8 is three people in 100. Again, we have 340 million people in this country. So this is actually a very, very large number. And we know that probably the true numbers of people suffering with eating disorders is larger than what we think because 
people often don't seek treatment or want to talk about it. Another thing that I think is important to get across is that eating disorders are dangerous. And approximately one person will die every hour from an eating disorder. They, are, they carry a high mortality, and as Steve said earlier today, amongst the psychiatric illnesses, they have the highest mortality rate, or anorexia nervosa does. But let's not forget that bulimia nervosa can lead to very serious medical consequences, particularly if someone's purging 10, 20, 30 times a day, or using laxatives in incredibly large quantities, or diuretics. And I also wanted to say that young people ages 15 to 24 years are 10 times more likely than their peers to, to die from an eating disorder, if they have an eating disorder. So we, we have a few more numbers here for anorexia nervosa, and I, you know, I don't want to bombard you. And again, I live in this world of PowerPoints and numbers, so I'm trying to make it a little less boring than that. But I think what I'm pointing out on this slide, and I'm not sure if these will be available to you later, but you, if you want numbers, um, I'd be happy to email the presentation to you. But I think amongst this, what stood out to me in my learning about eating disorders is that women with, or people with anorexia nervosa, half will die from the medical causes, but half will die from suicide. Suicide is very much um, common in, I don't wanna say common, but it is a concern in anorexia nervosa compared to bulimia. Um, suicide is also a real concern, but suicide attempts are more common in bulimia nervosa. I'm just going to skip through these. So what I want to talk to you about is collaborating with the primary care physician. And what I've found is that I think as physicians, we often take for granted what people think we do. And so, again, I want to apologize if this is too basic, but I, I, I've even had good friends who really don't understand what I've done and what my training is. So I'm just going to lay this out so it's clear. So um, primary care physicians have completed an MD, a DO, or if they're from another country, an MBBS. So we've all gone to medical school. Most of us, unless you're from another country, it was a postgraduate medical school. And if you're from another country, it was a longer period of time in college. Um, after that, we typically complete a residency. Usually that takes about three years. And in that three years, we are practicing physicians, but we're practicing supervised physicians. So when I say I'm board certified in family medicine, I'm telling you that I've worked with um, populations from birth to the grave. I've done everything from deliver babies to hold someone's hand as they passed away. I've counseled families in those end of life stages and I've helped people in the ICU and done everything in between. That's what family physicians do. Um, we are the traditional physicians. Although our roles are trying, they're trying to compartmentalize all of us. Some of us go on to do fellowships, and we're very fortunate here in Hawaii. We have a family medicine physician who went on to do an adolescent health fellowship with a focus on eating disorders. And I'm sorry, Pia, I'm putting you on the spot. Dr. Pia Francisco is sitting in the back of the room over there, and she works with adolescents in Kapiolani. She works with the eating disorder program there, but she also admits up to 24 years of age. And um, this is her specialty, this is what she does, and I'm really happy she's here with us today. But she comes also from a family practice background. Um, internal medicine physicians often serve as someone's primary care physician, although they typically deal with adults only. Pediatricians are often someone's primary care physician. And in the course of having doctors, a lot of people have a pediatrician when they're younger, and then they kind of lose, what, well, where do we go next? And I'm here to remind you, they can come
come see us. You can come see family physicians. Some people use their OBGYN, and even some psychiatrists will, will it, it really depends on the skill set. I have not heard of that in the five years I've been in Hawaii, but I have heard that that happens. And then some people use a naturopathic physician, and I don't know a whole lot about that training program, but I do understand they complete a doctor of naturopathy and do it, they may or may not go on to do a residency, but can order labs and evaluate labs. So what patients with eating disorders need is they need a non-assumptive, non-binary, patient goals-oriented perspective. And by non-assumptive, I mean they don't need me to say to them, I am your doctor and you need my level of wellness. That's not what that means. Um, I should not, as their physician, assume that I know what they want. The goals are their goals. I am there to say to them, how can I use my medical knowledge to help you reach your goals? By non-binary, I mean not to make assumptions about gender identity, um, and particularly in this day and age where we're becoming more educated about the difference between gender identity and gender assignment. Next, I wanted to mention that um, patients need a multidisciplinary care team that communicates regularly and uses an evidence base. By communicating regularly, we are giving the same message to our patient again and again and again. And that's really valuable. If we're using a similar evidence base or the same evidence base, that helps reinforce the message that we're giving to our patients over and over again. So communication is key. And what I can see here in Hawaii, and as I'm a newbie in this, but I think it's a fair assessment to say that we're under-resourced in eating disorders. Um, I don't think there's very many physicians who've stood up and said, I work with patients with eating disorders, let's work together. Um, and so, I think if we're not already communicating with our primary care physicians, with our patients, let's start. Let's educate them. If your patient has a primary care physician they really like and enjoy going to, well, I'm happy to help with that if there's anything I can do to talk to that physician because your patient, what they need is what's more important than anything else, you know, if that's gonna work for them. But talk to them, don't avoid them, include them in what's happening so we can give that consistent message. And we also need permission, the patient needs permission to be seen as a whole person. They are more than their eating disorder, a whole lot more than their eating disorder. So when we talk about approaching the patient from a holistic approach to connect the body, the soul, and the mind. We need to re remember that's what they need. And one thing that eating patients with eating disorders need is for us to help encourage the healthy voice to speak to the eating disorder voice. I'm sorry, I keep clicking the wrong <laughs> Okay. So why would you refer to a PCP? What's the role of a PCP? Well, to establish a baseline medical evaluation, because if they're in treatment, it gives us a benchmark, or some, at least a starting point. We also want to identify if there's patient is suffering from any medical complications from the eating disorder that need to be addressed urgently, semi-urgently, or can be addressed over the long term. And as we all know, this is a, a condition that that we have to think in long term here. This is not something that is going to get fixed quickly which is really where a lot of doctors make their mistake. And they often don't mean to, but um, we are pretty good at quick fixes of numbers, and we get anxious when we can't do that. So doctors are well-meaning, but I think the lack of education in eating disorders may mean that we often um, try and go for quick fixes. So we talked a little bit already about developing a relationship with the primary care physician. The primary care physician can also be there to monitor weight and nutrition status. 
but I would recommend that that is, again, something that is decided amongst the treatment team. Who is going to be responsible for that and how? And what form is that going to take? It may be not convenient for the patient to go see their primary care doctor for that. Maybe it's better done by the dietitian. Maybe the psychotherapist is more suited to doing that. So every case is individualized. And PCPs, the physician can help with the strategies of the other team members. Again, consistent messaging. And in some cases, um, the PCP is the care coordinator and sort of stays on top of it. It really depends on the culture of where you're working and that individual patient. So when should you refer to a primary care physician? Ideally, as soon as therapy starts. There should be no delay, there should be no waiting. We wanna make sure that we're not missing a potentially serious complication. And I think maybe Anita pointed to this earlier. What you see is not necessarily how sick a person is from a, a numbers point of view, a doctor point of view. This is one of those conditions where, I mean, doctors can be quite good at telling sick from not sick. But I don't think in the world of eating disorders, it is quite so obvious. I mean, malnourishment, sure, there's some obviousness to that. But in general, across the spectrum, not so much. So if your patient is coming to you and they said that, or you know, even maybe noticed severe rapid weight loss, they're complaining of lightheadedness or dizziness, or if their binge purge behavior is uncontrolled, if they have constant coldness, medical distresses such as chest pain or abdominal pain, that would be a time to get a medical evaluation. So if something changes in the course of treatment and these are the symptoms they're telling you they have, better catch up with the PCP so that we can fulfill our piece of the puzzle and help support the patient. Also, if you feel that maybe some sort of um, medication would help augment treatment, seeing a physician for that may be helpful. And also for periodic checkups and waiting. One thing I would warn is to avoid delaying a patient seeing a physician in lieu of insight. A patient can have a lot of good insight into their disease, but if they're continuing to lose weight, um, if they are, and the weight loss is severe, if the binge purge patterns or the binge patterns are out of control, and there's no change, then I would again recommend a medical evaluation. So the insight, I don't wanna, I mean, I, I don't wanna devalue it, it's extremely important. But I'm here to, to represent the people that represent the physical side of things and our assessment of that. If you have a patient you've been seeing for a long time and you're suspecting an eating disorder, but you know, maybe you're, you're, you finished school and, and you weren't really working in eating disorders and you were seeing the patient for other reasons, the tool that has been used widely amongst primary care physicians, or is at least said to be used, is the SCOF screening tool. And it's a series of questions, very simple, very easy to look up. And it's, the questions are, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry you have lost control over how much you have eaten? Have you recently lost more than one stone? That's a little confusing. <laughs> so I can tell you in Australia, I still have patients that would refer to their weight in stones. <laughs> and I just still <laughs> had a hard time understanding it. But one stone is 14 pounds. So this is where this comes from. But this is actually supported by the American Academy of Family Practice. So it's very much an American tool as well. Um, so have you recently lost more than 14 pounds in a three month period? And do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you are too thin? And would you say that food dominates your life? So this questionnaire, two or more questions, is actually highly specific and sensitive for an eating disorder screen. 
And if you are not working in the field of eating disorders, but this is what you're thinking and you don't know where to start, send them to a primary care physician. That's a good place to start because they'll have to have that medical evaluation. There's another one. You can look up these up, but the scoff is the one that is most widely discussed in the literature. Other questions you might ask if you're suspicious that one of your patients has an eating disorder and you're trying to decide whether or not you um, want to send them or maybe it's come up suddenly, just to plant some seeds in your mind of other questions you could ask. You don't have time to look up the scoff questionnaire that that doctor talked about way back when. Well, you know, are you extremely concerned about your weight? Does attaining a different weight or shape dominate your life? Are you dieting? Have you lost significant weight? Do you experience binge eating or other eating out of control? Do you purge after meals? It's okay to ask that. Do you exercise compulsively? Is there an over-evaluation? Oh, okay, so this one, I did get this from a website, but listen, it's a good point, but I probably rephrase this. So, is there an over-evaluation of the benefits of slimness or shape change that overrides normal concerns? And I think that's more um, your evaluation of the way the patient is talking to you rather than a question you would ask. But other more simple things you could say is, do you like your body? And if not, and if someone says no, well, what don't you like your body about your body? And that might help give you a guide. So some of the risk factors, I think um, earlier today it was discussed that in the early days, as Steve was pointing out, that there was a, a quest to find the biological cause of eating disorders. But really we know the risk factors for eating disorders follow up the, the biopsychosocial model. So biologically, we know there's a very strong link between family history of obesity, but also other mental health illnesses such as anxiety and depression. Females are more, there's a greater preponderance of females that have eating disorders. And a history of dieting or other weight control. A negative energy balance. And by negative energy balance, what I'm referring to is what's been observed amongst high school and college teens, when maybe they have some more control over when they eat and what they eat. And what's frequently seen in patients or who are people who are interested in or concerned about their body image is skipping breakfast, having a light lunch, and then having the effects of starvation throughout the day which then later leads to binging. And this can set up a pattern. So at some point, that pattern of, of feeling hung, of starving and feeling hungry and then binging to make up for the lost calories or the lost energy during the day, I think kind of then more gets into what Anita's realm was this morning about um, the eating then becomes something that is done to fulfill the emotional distress. Type one diabetics are, have a, are at risk of developing eating disorders, and as much as 25% of women with type one diabetes may develop an eating disorder. And in the, the way that the pathophysiology of diabetes in type one works is without insulin, the body needs to break down muscle and fat in order to get energy when it would normally get energy from glucose. And in doing so, a person typically becomes very, very thin. And so by not taking insulin, which is a necessary part of our biology, a person could become very thin. However, the, the, the complications of diabetes wreak, wreaks havoc on their bodies. And also excessive weight gain during childhood or puberty has been noted to be a risk factor. Psychologically, it was discussed the perfectionism idea this morning. In particular, self-oriented perfectionism, which involves setting unrealistically high expectations of oneself. Body image dissatisfaction 
higher levels of body image dissatisfaction, but taking it one step further and really internalizing that dissatisfaction, a personal history of anxiety disorder. I, um, a couple of years ago, I was listening to an Australian podcast about um, some of the current research on eating disorders, and I was really interested to learn that the anxiety factor fits in with those emotions of anxiety, they're starting to measure some, some biochemistry that shows that purging causes an anesthetic effect, um, and that starving also has an anesthetic effect, a numbing effect, um, that can, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> anyway. that can quell the anxiety that the patient is feeling. And then the other one that I wanted to mention was behavioral inflexibility. So that in itself sort of describes a person that may have some difficulty when change happens, and change happens. And sometimes change is very uncomfortable. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. Socially, um, size and weight prejudice can be a factor. And often we see that in sports, particularly gymnastics and um, wrestling, other professions like modeling and acting. Thinner is better is kind of a strong message that we get everywhere. Um, and so there's a prejudice there. And also weight-based teasing and bullying, and that can come from anywhere. It can come from family members, it can come from friends, and it can come from strangers. Comments from people who have influence, again, the coaches, the teachers, educators. Thin ideal, I, the thin ideal. There's also an increased risk in the lesbian, gay, transgender, and queer community. But just to set aside a myth that um, gay, all, there's a myth out there that all men who are gay have anorexia, if, if they have anorexia, they must be gay. Um, there's a myth that I came across in some of my research. Acculturation refers to the westernization of cultures. So as we see more countries become westernized, we see that the rates of eating disorders has increased. People with smaller social networks may be at a higher risk in um, anorexia nervosa in particular, which is a very isolating condition, or isolation might be something that's happening early on. So some of the medical complications, and there are many, I'm just gonna focus on just a few. So when I get referred a patient who has an eating disorder, it could probably be any one of these categories that I'm expecting to see. Um, and I'm sure you probably can think of one or two that I have not. But um, many primary care physicians see people with eating disorders that's not been previously recognized. And if we're not looking for it, we're not gonna see it. Um, they might have a known eating disorder, but they're not engaged in any treatment whatsoever. They may have an eating disorder and they are in active treatment. They are in relapse, they are in remission, partial remission, or full remission. So when I'm seeing a patient, what's going through my mind is, is that the complications of malnutrition and weight loss can involve every organ system, and damage occurs at every level. Dysfunction arises from the body's compensatory mechanisms. The body is actually really quite elegant in trying to maintain homeostasis or balance. And in doing so, what we see is the pathology when that is really, when the body is starved and it doesn't have adequate nutrients, or if there is something that's happened to upset it, things will happen. Um, when people lose weight or are not taking any glucose in, the body will use fat and muscle, including the heart muscle, that is not spared. Dysfunction um, might be related either then, therefore, to acute and chronic caloric deprivation, 
or mechanical disruptions in the fat balance in the body, as well as might be related to the sequelae of purging or the process of refeeding itself. So just to point out every system, this is a list, probably not comprehensive, but does detail several of the medical complications that affect anorexia nervosa. And it is truly every system. And just to hone in a little bit. So, so cardiovascular, um, people, you may already be familiar with it, when people die from anorexia nervosa, there's been a lot of studies linking it to um, the cardiovascular complications. One of the early signs we see is bradycardia. Um, but I think what's starting to come out and what specialists in the area are saying is that without glucose in the body, the heart can't pump, and that it, it may actually be um, the hypoglycemia that leads to death, which leads to cardiac arrest. Other ones that, um, hepatitis, I just kind of wanted to mention this because hepatitis re refers to an inflammation of the liver and abnormal liver function tests. When someone tells you they had hepatitis, I just wanted to distinguish that this is different from hepatitis, the virus, either A, B, or C, A, which recently affected Hawaii through the contaminated sushi, but it's not the virus. It's the liver either eating itself up for energy, or it's the enzymes in the liver going up because they are trying to find other sources of glucose, namely glycogen, in the liver itself. The bone marrow becomes suppressed, and as the body is shutting itself down, it is trying to reduce all of its processes that require energy, including making blood cells, white blood cells and red blood cells, as well as some clotting factors. And so in doing so, the bone marrow becomes full of a gelatinous material. And I heard a story recently of a patient who developed anorexia nervosa and the parents were quite concerned and thought she must have cancer. And that led to seeing a lot of specialists and a bone marrow biopsy. And because her white counts were down, her hemoglobin was down, she was anemic, her platelets were down, but in fact, she had anorexia. And by looking for other causes of the weight loss, her treatment was delayed. Amenorrhea is, is referring to when a woman's periods stop. So in anorexia, amenorrhea is technically when periods have stopped for more than three months. And that is due to an upset in the, the hormonal axis involved in regulating periods. And the result of that can be a decreased estrogen in the body, which we know is linked to calcium deposition in bone. So amenorrhea, therefore, is the strongest predictor of bone loss in anorexia, which is, leads to osteoporosis and bone fragility. And just to give a sense, normal bone is on the right, whereas a bone with osteoporosis is on the left. So again, part of the link in the chain, not the whole link, is the decreased estrogen. And I say that like an Australian, I think you say estrogen but also um, decreased um, estrogen causes the symptoms of menopause. So a patient might be complaining of things like night sweats, irritability, um, it might increase depression. So some other things to look out for. Refeeding syndrome, I'm sure the dietitians in the room can probably teach me a few things about um, refeeding syndrome. And I know in my time in hospitals, they certainly have. But refeeding syndrome is potentially life-threatening, and if not identified early and not understood, then you will lose the patient. So it results from changes in electrolytes that occur within the first two to three days of refeeding. Um, there are fluid shifts in the starved person as a result of this, resulting in edema and heart failure. The pump is working 
against a river. And you know, if you're if you're all of a sudden the river is full and overflowing and the pump's trying to work against all this, well, you can have heart failure. Um, part of what happens is that the metabolism is shifting from using other sources of energy to carbohydrates. And we use our carbohydrates to form glucose. We need insulin to attach onto the cells to increase the glucose uptake into the cells. And when it's doing that, it takes other vital electrolytes with it, phosphate and potassium. And so we then deplete the blood of phosphate and, and potassium. And so the electrolytes get all out of order. Likewise, sodium, the kidneys start to hang on to sodium and where salt goes, water follows. So another contributing factor to the edema. So when a patient has hypophosphatemia, because now the cells have taken up the phosphates that's there, they can have diaphragmatic muscle fatigue. What that means is the diaphragm, which is involved with normal, everyday, unconscious breathing, is now fatigued. So respiratory failure is a very real concerning complication. Rhabdomyolysis can occur. That's when the muscle is breaking down rapidly, and that can lead further to kidney damage. Seizures can occur, as well as congestive heart failure. When the potassium is low in hypokalemia, Rhabdomyolysis can occur, seizures can occur, and cardiac arrhythmias can occur, also fatal. And edemia we talked about before. So when it comes to refeeding syndrome, the key really is, is identifying is who is at risk. And so who is at risk has been outlined by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines for the management of refeeding syndrome. And they have two categories. In one, it only takes a BMI less than 16 or unintentional weight loss of greater than 15% in the previous three to six months or little or no nutritional intake for greater than 10 days and low levels of potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium before refeeding. So the patient's already depleted before refeeding. Likewise, um, two or more of the following, and one would be less than 18.5 BMI, an unintentional weight loss of greater than 10% in the last three to six months, little or no nutrition intake for greater than five days. And I, you know, that one's really important to be aware of because as I learned when I, I visited Iapono in Maui, um, I, it was a fabulous opportunity and one thing that came up when I was talking to the staff there was how active an eating disorder often becomes when a patient is entering just before they're going into treatment, particularly in a residential treatment center, um, because they know they're gonna have to face this. And this is gonna be hard, it's gonna be a journey. And so certainly in that setting, refeeding syndrome is a very real concern as, as we discussed in, in Maui, and they are you know, very prepared for, for and know what to look for. And then other things that may contribute is a history of alcohol abuse or abuse of drugs, including insulin itself, but also chemotherapy, antacids, and diuretics. So we talked a little bit already about hypoglycemia and it may be life-threatening if not recognized, for sure, for sure, for sure. And I mentioned already the, the cardiac loss of muscle. Um, that, that's something that is really important when we talk about treatment, which we're not really gonna talk about in any detail today, but when someone is being refed or perhaps they're being given IV fluids, the heart that has lost its muscle mass is now overloaded with volume, and the heart may also tip into heart failure as a result of that. In bulimia, I think you're probably familiar with a lot of the medical complications with bulimia. Amongst these is dental erosion, parotid swelling, gastrointestinal reflux, um, I, when someone is purging
stitching frequently, there is also a risk of tearing the esophagus, and we call that Mallory Weiss tears. Those tears can go on to bleed, and that could lead to life life-threatening anemia, that would be reasonable to say if the bleeding's not stopped or if for some reason the patient is not able to coagulate, but also um, the contents, if something is put in the gut and there is a tear in there, there's a risk that that could go into what we call the mediastinum, which is the chest. And in the chest we have our, up here in the middle, we have our heart, we have our lungs, we have multiple large blood vessels. You don't want an infection there that's called mediastinitis, and I have seen patients struggle with that, not from eating disorders, but it is pretty horrendous to have and takes a very long time to treat. Also, uh, other risks in bulimia nervosa include aspiration pneumonia, and so that's inhaling um, gastric contents or foreign bodies into the lungs, which then seeds an infection also typically treated with the stronger amongst the antibiotics. Irregular menses is common in bulimia nervosa, nervosa, not so much amenorrhea, but the patient may actually, from my point of view, the first sign of an eating disorder may be someone that's come to me and said, hey, my periods are suddenly out of whack, what's going on, you know? Then maybe I ought to look a little bit further and say, well, let's see what else is going on. And then there are a number of potentially life-threatening metabolic disturbances in very severe cases. Again, low potassium, which we talked about before, with anorexia, which can lead to cardiac arrhythmias, among other things, um, because the potassium is lost when the gastric contents are brought up, but also in the use of diuretics. Pseudo-Barber syndrome is something that's caused, it's, it's kind of complicated metabolically, but it's caused when a person is chronically volume depre depleted, and the body compensates then by retaining water. You might see this in, in patients who have, when they've stopped binging, and this can happen a couple days later, and they become a bit edematous, and then they don't like it because they feel fat, and it seems counter to what they're trying to do, but it may actually be the result of pseudo barter syndrome, and it can last up to two to three weeks. There's really no specific treatment. Sometimes doctors will start a medication for that, but um, it, elevating legs, um, that sort of thing is often recommended and it should resolve. It's just helping the patient through the psychological effects of feeling edematous and different. I think we covered a lot of those ones. In binge eating disorder, not all patients with binge eating disorder are obese. I think this may be a myth that some doctors might think, but obesity is common. Therefore, in binge eating disorder, in addition to some of um, other things, well, not in addition to, but things that are associated with obesity, such as cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, um, and type 2 diabetes, and increased risk of stroke are all very real increased risks in these patients, as well as metabolic syndrome, which is a triad of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and type 2 diabetes which has been associated with poor cardiovascular outcomes. So in conclusion, I just, for a few collaboration pearls, um, therapy should happen when the physician is assured, you can be assured that their medical, the patient is well enough. So the patient has seen a physician, they've had a medical evaluation, and it's safe. I mean, we're all about being safe too, right? We wanna get the patient treated, but we wanna do it safely and, and in the right place. And Steve talked earlier about the levels of care, and that's where that fits in. Um, establish a frequency of contact schedule with the patient, that's for you, and include in that when they the conditions on which they should return to their physician. Decide on a frequency of measuring body weight and who will be responsible for this, as we discussed earlier. 
and clearly define the roles of the members of the tree team. I'm, if you're the therapist or the dietitian, and, and you're, the, I'm gonna try not to jump in your lane. Let's work together. Again, consistent messages. In the eating disorder literature, they talk about trying to decide who is the captain of the, the ship. And that's important. This is not about ego. As a physician, that you know, we, we deal with a lot of emergencies, and what we found is the reason basic life support and advanced cardiac life support and advanced trauma life support exists is because we used to care for people in crises without organization. And every team needs to have a leader. So it, it just is, again, it's not about the ego, it's about the patient. What is gonna help that patient? We need to put ego at the door. But it would be good to have someone who's coordinating, you know, who's keeping a treatment plan. That's what I intend to do, um, build in the next couple weeks as a treatment plan. And on my treatment plan, which I haven't developed yet, and maybe it's already been developed and I just haven't found it, I am going to have, who's the dietitian? What's their plan? Who is a therapist? What's their plan? What do they want me to know? So that I'm not just doing labs and saying, yeah, they look fine, you know? This is about a team. Um, decide who will instruct on health and nutrition. If you are from somewhere where you don't have a dietitian that's comfortable with eating disorders, as a primary care physician, that might come back to me. So it's just something to think about. Um, and again, working together for the goals of patient care. So Philip Mailer is from Acute Denver and I relied heavily on his materials and will continue to do so. He's an internal medicine physician who's been in the field for a very long time. And he says treatment and prevention of eating disorders involves a community of caring, concerned individuals who are knowledgeable, thoughtful, and proactive. You can't tell how sick a patient is by looking at them and their problems are complex. So just in closing, um, the community physicians that I currently know about, it's a very small list. If you know of any more, please tell me. I want to know because I'm not going to be the right physician for every patient. That's just the way it is. But I want every patient to have the right physician. So Dr. Pia Francisco is here today. I'm so glad she made it because I know she had a lot of clinical duties today. And again, she's an adolescent health specialist with a focus on eating disorders, among other things. Um, and she certainly, you can talk to her. I, I will see your patients. I will do what I can. I will learn from you. We will learn from each other. Dr. Sonia Patel is a child and adolescent psychiatrist um, that works with Dr. Francisco quite frequently at Kapiolani. And Dr. Perry Heinz is a child and adolescent psychiatrist who works with Ipono in Maui. Again, if you, I've asked around, I haven't really found many physicians or psychiatrists in the field, but if you know someone, please tell me. And if you would like to be in a directory of resources, if you're working in, in the eating disorder community, I would like to build a directory so that we can communicate. So I'm gonna leave my notebook in front, and if you can put on it, uh, what you do, who you work for, if you work for somewhere, and um, your contact details. Over the coming months, I'd like to get something started that we can all use. And then there's, there's a list of some internet resources. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>
She fit in the right age range, and I, I definitely saw what you're saying was that this is kind of different. I mean, she, she came in with lots of magazines, and I want to look like that. I want to look like that. And her mom was terrified. And, you know, I, I haven't caught up with Pia since then, but I one day ran into the mom and the daughter at Capulani, and they, they remembered me and gave me a big hug and said thank you so much because they ended up getting treatment there. So. I, I don't know if you are able to comment on that, Pia? Yeah, yeah um, I, I do remember that patient and she did very well after, but in relation to your question, there is a, um, so in the criteria for eating disorders, uh, what used to be eating disorder not otherwise specified is now avoided restricted food intake disorder, and from um, clinical practice that can be present in, in um, patients who would have in, um, uh, developmental delays or it's usually it's surrounded by um, more frequently by an unpleasant experience of food in the past for example a choking experience or just not being able to have diversity in their food choices as they were younger and that's how why that's why it's common to be present in developmentally delayed children um, the treatment is you know which is uh, still very good, psychotherapy, and also having good nutrition. Uh, however, the, the therapy probably might uh, have a, di uh, a little different approach if, if it's um, avoided with food and different sort. But there is, so it, it's not uncommon. You're welcome. Okay, I think we're gonna do some more questions later. 